Okay, is this is this Anna? Yeah. Um, I have a question about um, I mean, the general se theme seems to be seems to have been that that um, um, for these three figures and for the Aristotelian tradition in general, law of nature in the sense of a universal constraint on inanimate nature um, is not the operative concept, but rather individual powers in different kinds of things. Is that a fair? Right, uh, the individual powers, but I mean, individual powers uh, pertain to individuals by virtue of their membership in a exactly. natural kind. Exactly. So you start with uh, the powers right. that are constitutive of natural kinds, and right. then you get to what powers the individuals have, and uh, the powers constitutive of different natural kinds set up relations among them, and so on. And that's the way they conceptualize, and they they only barely conceptualize regularities in nature in terms of law, and the, the barely was that example I gave you uh, from Aquinas' analogical application. Right, that, that, that's what I was gonna ask you, um, is, I mean, you, you, you did talk about laws of nature in, in Thomas in non-rational creatures. Uh, did you mean they're animals, or did you mean non does water cool Water. Them? Anything that other than uh, humans and angels uh, count uh, falls in, falls into that category for him. Okay, but then at the end you also talked about laws in a more general sense, divine laws that um, uh, seem to govern nature, about God's decisions to behave in one way rather than another. Okay. Um, Basically, this is not something that uh, I found in Aquinas, but it is something that I found in Scotus, and these are the passages that I owed you, Nancy. Um, um, and Scotus doesn't say that there is a law uh, that says fire always, for the most part, heats. What he says is that God has a policy about whether or not to concur with natural agents for each state. So he thinks that because of the, the human, human nature has a history, you know, with Adam's fall, we divide it into chapters, and he thinks that for each of these chapters, which they call states, this is a division he inherits from Augustine, um, there are different policies, and a lot of these policies have to do with soteriological um, um, arrangements, right, what, what humans have to do to get on board with a happy ending and so forth. Um, uh, but he also thinks that the different states go with different concurrence policies. So this is what comes out explicitly in SCOTUS. <coughs> so that he thinks that, um, and of course they all think there are different concurrence policies for different states, but, but SCOTUS is the one who brings it out. And he says, well, look, um, um, there, um, God, God has decided that in, in, this, uh, w in this world, uh, Always a for the most part, but then I noted it's complicated by uh, some exceptions. Yeah. But always, a, always a for the most part, to to uh, concur with natural agents, so they get to do their thing. Right? But in the war life to come, that's not going to happen. And in, and then he says, which very provocatively, that the same sort of um, obstruction of a natural activity in this state will count as miraculous, but in the next state will not because of the different policy change. Okay. Thank so you. the law so law com, law really has to do only with voluntary agents, but since the big voluntary agent is one who can obstruct or not um, uh, by concurring or not with the natural causal powers, um, those policies redound to um, different kinds of regularities um, with respect but to But he doesn't call them laws. Well, he doesn't. Um, and he, what, what kind of language does he use to talk about the policies? Um, I'm sorry. In Distinction 44, he talks about laws. Now, his attention there is on grace conferral, right? So that's, mm -hmm. that's, um, that's an effect produced in rational creatures. But, but he gets off, uh, people will ask, well, could God do it differently and so on. And, um, and so he, then he gets focused on this idea that since God is the lawmaker, laws have to be general, but since God is the lawmaker, God can't break the law, so if God does something contrary to a given law, that's tantamount to establishing a different law. And you think, and how are we going to preserve generality in any, any medieval sense? But, um, but never mind, right? But, but the point is, 
Um, so then you might think, at first I thought, and this one passage in Distinction 49 of Book 4 made me think at first, um, that uh, when God, God has this general policy to, co to, um, to um, concur with natural causes in this, this world, and that's a law that God has instituted, and God has a different policy for the next world, and that would be an alternative law. But the trouble is, um, since he believes in miracles in this world, such a law wouldn't turn out to be general. Um, so his use, and, and, and his, if he really thinks that those policies are laws for the next state, then uh, various things shouldn't turn out to be miraculous, but then he talks about them as miraculous. So it, it's a muddied usage. Thank you. Okay. It does. Hello, is that on? Yeah, I, I clicked. Is that, is that on now? Yeah. Uh, so I've got a question about concurrence. Uh, a lot of these people are concurrentists, and as you know, uh, concurrence as a metaphysical position is somewhat problematic. Malebranche's occasionalism proceeds via indirectly by rejecting the intelligibility of divine concurrence. And you didn't touch very much on the metaphysics of concurrence, but you mentioned, I think, that Aquinas has this notion of production of natures, conserving of natures, and then concurring with natures, which is something like an instrumental account applying the powers in particular instances. Um, as you know, Ferdoso uh, treated some of the difficulties with making sense of concurrence and some of the constraints the metaphysical model of concurrence has to, has to respect. For example, uh, it's not, you're not allowed to split the effect so that the creature produces one bit of it God produces another bit of it because then you wouldn't have a model of concurrence because the creature could do something on its own and it's supposed to be part of concurrence that the creature can't do anything without divine concurrence, which is how it's been used in order to square an Aristotelian essentialism with you know, the demand for divine miracles. Um, so my question is, in modern philosophy, this has become a big issue now, and if you just look at Leibniz, there's a proliferation of interpretations of concurrence within Leibniz. So Slay says, there is this model of concurrence in Leibniz whereby uh, God creates what's perfect in creatures and creatures create what's limited. Um, Bob says that comes maybe a bit too close to occasionalism. Bob is another interpretation where he says maybe the model of concurrence is that God produces the creatures producing. The worry about that is it looks like it might come too close to conservationism. And then Sakjalia has got another model according to which God recreates the states of creatures you know, in accordance with earlier states. And this looks like it might come too close to occasionalism. Um, so there is a worry about whether any sense can be made of this notion of divine concurrence as all of these figures you were talking about use it. Do you have a favorite model? Do you have a model that, think, that you think works, uh, that can answer the kinds of problems that Ferdosa raises? No. No? Um, basically, um, I don't. Uh, so. Um, so the question is, what is it that God does? So if we start out with our Aristotelian universe, um, or that's where they started anyway, um, and the Aristotelian universe um, has a, a view according to which um, these natu each natural kind comes with a package of causal powers and active and passive causal powers, and in uh, Aristotelian um, physics, roughly speaking, as they understood it, uh, if you get the patient close enough to the agent, then the uh, um, interaction happens, and that's all that needs to be the case. So, I mean, all that you need to explain if you were Aristotle would be how did they, how did they get close enough for the interaction to occur, right? So, in a sense, um, um, that's all that that's all you need, and it might be that, that with things here below, um, you need some um, motion of the heavenly bodies to heat up the elements in different ways so that things move around, and that will explain how things move around so that you can get them close enough to interact or whatever. Um, uh, I, I'm sure that Ed will give a, a more accurate ex explanation of that, that, that picture, but in any event, um, uh, you start with that, and then you say, okay, so like, what is it that God is supposed to do? I mean, didn't we... Didn't we get it all? Um, haven't we accounted for everything now? Uh, if you're going to stick with an Aristotelian physics model, right? And um, 
so the first answer is, well, we have to pull out the ontological props and we have to say that whereas Aristotle thought that natural kinds and the heavens and all that sort of thing existed as it were necessarily, um, um, uh, we need to account for the being of these kinds, right? And the being of the heavens. And we, not, we need to account not only for why they exist in the first place, but why they continue to exist. So creation and conservation. So everybody's on board with that. Say, okay, um, let's, um, let's go along with that. Um, somehow that strikes me, maybe it's just because I'm so used to it, but anyway, that strikes me as is okay, right? And then you say, well, okay, um, but suppose God is creating and conserving these things and we've got the, wa the water in the tea kettle is close to the fire uh, in the stove, and so um, what else do we need, right? And um, what, so what they, what they say is uh, something like this. Um, they say um, God has to activate or apply the uh, powers to their effect. Um, now, this is not simply a theological doctrine in a way. It also uh, goes with uh, the theories of Scotus and Aquinas and most of Occam's predecessors. Occam rejects this. Um, um, that, that somehow there are essential orders of causes and that, ca that, that, that there can be causal chains that culminate in effect in which um, the, the posterior cause depends on the prior cause in causing that it can't use its causal power unless the prior cause does something. And then you say, so like, what does it do? <laughs> you know, what does it do? Now, when it's the hand that moves the stick that moves the ball, the answer is, well, it moves it. But of course, they're not mostly interested in locomotion, really. They're mostly interested in production and existence. So, um, so what else is there to do? Aquinas doesn't give you any hints, really. Scotus doesn't say anything either, right? Um, and so Occam comes along and says, well, you haven't given any clear account of this, right? Um, of, of the essential order of causes in general. And so then you say, but of course, of, of course you were kind of leaning on that to explain what it is that, that God does in concurring with the causes, right? right. Um, so, um, so I think Occam is right. They haven't given a, an account, right? They haven't given a clear Clear account. But you don't want to be a, a, a mere conservationist like Gerandus yourself. Do you like the concurrentist position? Do you think that's the position that the theists should take? Do I think concurrentism is a... a I think that uh, it would be bad for a theist to have to say that God can't do anything to stop natural causes from um, uh, acting. Um, and of course their way of explain the way that Aquinas and Scotus have of saying uh, of explaining how God stops them from acting is to say, well, he withholds concurrence. So he's, they have some idea that there's something, some con causal contribution he's making that he doesn't give. If you don't believe that there's such a contribution, then you're going to have to say something else. Um, um, yeah, but I think, it's, I, I think it's a problem. Yeah, but I want to say, what I want to say is that whereas Occam problematizes the notion of essential orderings of causes, um, in general, um, um, there's not a lot of atten analytical attention given by these people to what it means to, for one cause to activate or to um, um, enable another cause to do its thing, except insofar as a common sense idea that if you need two causes to produce the effect, they've both got to do their things to get it. I mean, um, so that there's no analysis of concurrence. And there's also no, um, the, Occasionalism is not taken seriously, and the, the Malebranche uh, um, determination, the argument from determinateness, um, is not ever formulated in these authors. Now, whether there's somebody between Occam and then that formulates it, I don't know, but, but uh, these authors don't formulate it, so far as I know, um, and they don't worry about it. So, so they just think that it would be ridiculous. I mean, they're so convinced that you can't be a thing unless you have them be inert. Um, that when they can't even imagine that that's what the Moors really meant, as, he, as Aquinas puts it. Well, they didn't really mean that. I could just say one more thing, which is this, that there are passages in Aquinas that divide up um, the causal contributions of the different metaphysical layers, right? So he says, well, you know, God gives the essa, and the, um, something else gives the nature, right? And then Beulah, by the time you get, we're talking about the production of Elsie the Cow by Beulah and Ferdinand, 
They don't give any, the being to Elsie. They don't even account for her getting bovinity because they can't account for the general existence of bovinity. Something else has to account for that. Um, um, what they do is account for um, the, uh, the motion of the matter in such a way as uh, that the form of the bovinity is taken on by this hunk. Uh, 